and then here we are with the chat and then we're gonna go here and then we're gonna go here and hopefully we have audio streaming now and we're gonna go here put it on Facebook and hopefully I'm not muted again Right, and this is public. Am I muted? You can hear. Okay, terrific. Terrific. Okay, we're gonna wait. And Honduras, that's pretty cool. We're gonna wait until we get a hundred folks. This is gonna be a very long, very informative stream. Very long. Oh gosh. Um. Ooh, I got a lot to tell you. This is going to be history in the making. Uh, yeah. So, good times. We got 35 people here. I got my monster. I've got my light on. I'm going to do that instead. I think that's a little better. I'm going to tell you all about Candy Darling. And why she's important. This is a history lesson, people. And there's going to be stuff here that's going to be revealed that's never been revealed before, which is really kind of exciting. Uh, so you guys will have cred because the book about her comes out supposedly later this year by Cynthia Carr. So she's going to be having this big cultural moment. And you can be like, Ugh, I was talking about her in January. You're still on this whole Candy Darling thing? Forget it. Um, yeah, so that's the situation there. Hold on, I'm going to... My chair's on the cord. One second. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right. Long, long story. I'm, I don't know where... Do I start with the journal? Do I start with the backstory? By the way, uh, I'm going to show you from her journal. Um, this was not cheap. So any contributions or super chats would be enormously appreciated. Uh not gonna lie um so what ha happened was um is that true that's pretty cool uh so okay we got 100 people in here so uh i hope all of you watched uh this week's episode of you're welcome with tom woods and we touched on something that i thought was an extremely uh interesting and complicated subject which is the issue of inspiration and where people get inspiration from and what inspires them and neither Tom nor I had any answers and um, quiplash with the dear leaders when uh, pander I don't know what you mean by pander Bradley um, for starting my weekend right thank you so much guys it's really appreciated this this is this is going to be one for the ages. I, this is I, I'm going to take my time because this is a big deal uh, to me at least, and I think it'll be of interest to people who are interested in culture. So one of the things I don't even know where to start. Uh, so one of the things that me and Tom were talking about on the show was inspiration. Where does inspiration come from? And what I was discussing with him is for me, and I think for a lot of people inspiration can be divorced from aspiration in the same way that some people don't understand this in the same way that some people look at Machiavelli and say thank you Ross monsters here I'm scared to have my monster near the journal um, in the same way that like people look at Machiavelli and they're like oh my god this guy's unconscionable he's amoral he's like yeah this isn't about morality. This is about strategy and execution. So I, I'm not talking morality. That's that's I'm separating the issues. Like, oh my God, how can you separate the issues? It's like, well, you know, if you're playing, certain things are more effective than others, and let's figure out what those are. And now I think that's kind of understood uh, generally, but at the time it was just, I mean, unconscionable. Or that you would be advocating uh, people do bad things or uh, immoral things, but at the same time it's like, well, we should discuss whether immoral things are effective because if they are, that leads to all sorts of other questions 
you know, that will it encourages people to act uh, immorally. Maybe our morality is not what we thought it was. Maybe it's not a relationship to reality and so on and so forth. So th there's a lot to unpack there. And one of the things that um, the right politically understands uh, in the recent times, I think in the last few years, and I talk about this heavily in the book, is that, uh, you know, it was Breitbart's observation that politics is downstream of culture. Uh, James Burnham, oh yeah, oh yeah, there's a, there's a whole chapter on James Burnham's Machiavellian's book. Thank you, Roger. Uh, that is the book to read, James Burnham's Machiavellian's. Um, what, what I find, uh, what I've been ruminating about in the last two weeks is, and if I'm all over the place, I'm sorry, but there's, I'm just, my head's been spinning because I don't have answers, is the Ayn Rand villain Peter Keating, who's often forgot about. And Peter Keating, in many ways, is an NPC. And he is what Rand describes as a selfless man. Not selfless in the sense of giving and caring, but a man who has no integrity and no sense of self or identity. And the way Rand came up with writing this character is when she was in Hollywood working in wardrobe, she met this woman and either overheard her, I think it was a direct conversation, and she was asking the woman how the woman came about her values, and the woman said, if no one had a car, then I don't want a car. But if someone has a car, then I want two cars. If someone has a house, I want a bigger house. And Rand, it must have been, you know, like you hear the sci-fi music, dee, dee, doo, dee, dee, doo, as the mass drops, and she realizes she's looking at someone who walks around, talks, eats, sleeps, goes to the bathroom, but isn't a human being in a very real sense of the world. There's no soul there. Uh, there she has no sense of self. And this Peter Keating, is the, uh, that became the character Peter Keating, who's the antagonist, of, one of the antagonists of the Fountainhead. Uh, he's bright. He's hardworking, he's achieving, but no one is home. And people like that uh, terrify me. And, and, repul and I'm opposed to them uh, on a visceral level, on an emotional level, on a philosophical level, on a psychological level. I, I, I can't speak poorly of them enough. And there's also something she talks about, which is the concrete bound mentality which, you know, you, you sit somebody down and you explain why the steel industry should be um, unregulated. And the guy goes, OK, you've convinced me. I don't think we should regulate the steel industry. What about the coal industry? And it's just like, holy shit. Like, like what, what do you even do at that point? So, again, the right understood that uh, in many ways that the left controls culture. And conservatives are, for years, have been playing on the left's playing field and playing basically defense. And what Trump did, if effectively, one of the good things about him is, it used to be if you say racist, 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 that ends the conversation, no, I'm not racist. And his response is, nah, fuck you. And then it's like, oh, well, that doesn't work. So now it's got ratcheted up to white supremacists. But this has also happened in the broader sense of culture. Meaning, when you talk about someone who's from a legitimately marginalized group, immediately, for many people, uh, it's like, oh, this is, this is for the left, for like modern-day progressives. And that's not how it was at all. At all, at all, at all. You're ceding so much ground, and a lot of times politics aren't even involved. And you're accepting their argument that if someone comes from this group, they're automatically, you know, going to be a Hillary Clinton Democrat. That makes no sense if you think about it. But it's, it's again, been the case that uh, so much of that has been in the, in the zeitgeist and people by hook, line, and sinker. What do you do with this information? I don't know. Uh, and I don't know where to go with this. But I'm always someone who, being a lifelong New Yorker, I am drawn to the outsider. I think they're often interesting. I, I think they're often not interesting. I think a lot of times someone wants to be, I'm going to use, should I read The Fountainhead or Alice Shrugged First? If you read Alice Shrugged First, it's the worst mistake of your life. Make sure you read The Fountainhead first. This, this is unambiguous. Unambiguous. It's a much better book in every way. Um, so I, and, and one of the things that I, um, when I first started getting involved in politics in a broad sense, what I found uh, sad is that uh, 
fringe political movements like the communists or like libertarian libertarians would take these random people and champion them and be like oh my god this person's so amazing and that person might be amazing in terms of their inspirational and their life story but in terms of their accomplishments it's it's they're none and I, I know just recently, and I'm, I'm, I apologize to whoever this was, someone wrote a biography of Joan Kennedy Taylor. Who, I mean, I know who she is. I've met her. What? And this is someone who's had a biography written about him, by the way. But the point of my biography isn't like I made these great accomplishments. It's like this is a character study. So it was very, very, very weird. So that brings me to Candy Darling. So she is someone who I find extremely inspirational in the sense of thought provoking because her life story is this Venn diagram of so many things that we talk about now and so much of where culture was when she was alive that you can sit and think about it in so many different ways uh, and it's a she's a fascinating fascinating person so let me tell you well here I'm gonna show you so this uh, I'll tell the story so she's born uh, little Jimmy Slattery is born in, uh, I don't know where he's born, but he grows up in Massapequa, Long Island. For those who don't know, Massapequa, Long Island is like, um, it's like the, the nadir, N-A-D-I-R, of suburban monotony. It's, it's, I mean, and this is where you have the worst kind of Peter, the Peter Keating mentality is pervasive there. Everyone think, everyone, no one has thoughts, and I'm sure there are exceptions. I'm not saying there aren't exceptions. I'm saying the, the milieu. People don't have thoughts. Uh, it's like, this is what your house looks like. This is what your life looks like. Uh, and, I'll, and, and so Candy, uh, Jimmy, as a kid, uh, his mom remarried. He had an older half-brother. And growing up, you know, very femme at school. And one day, or over a process, he would watch a lot of um, Hollywood movies on TV. And one day he woke up, or not one day, but he decided he was going to be a movie star. And not just a movie star, like specifically Kim Novak. This little boy decides this, okay? Now, this is just absolutely fascinating to me on one level, and here's how you can look at it. What does that mean in, in practice? So, one way to look at it, and I'm sure people who are Candy fans will be offended, but this is a, I'm using this as an analogy, not as the exact situation. Kafka, very famous author. Um, his book, The Metamorphosis, very important short story, novella. The opening sentence is something to the, I'm going to paraphrase it. After a night of fever dreams, Gregor Samson, I think his name is Gregor, woke up to find himself in the body of a giant insect. So the premise of this book is a guy wakes up, now he's a bug, what happens now? And the Peter Kiddings of the world be like, you're reading a book about a guy who becomes a bug? Uh, weird. And those people should be shot, but that's secondary. And the reason this kind of thinking is also extremely um, important is this is exactly how Einstein came up with his theory of relativity. Einstein asked himself, he had a series of thought experiments called Gedankas, and Einstein asked himself, what would happen if you are, um, I can see how many people are watching this. I'm, I'm, I'm quick with that block finger these days, people. Um, what happens if you're running at the speed of light and you turn on a flashlight? Uh, what do you mean you're running at the speed of light? Well, through this and thinking like this, Einstein determined his idea. And the idea that the speed of light is a constant uh, in all contexts was something that's complete counterintuitive and crazy. So, again, what happens when you as a young boy decide to wake up and you're going to be a beautiful blonde movie star? And Candy pulled it off. This is what I find so fascinating so what happens is she starts you know living her life as a woman taking the LIRR to New York uh, living a complete degenerate life and let me point out something else here this is very 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 germane to today's politics 
She was a complete pariah in her time. So when I was at Bucknell, which is a very waspy school, they had like a Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I remember sitting there and go, yeah, you guys give a shit now, but you wouldn't have given a shit in the 40s. And the same thing now with people like Candy. It's like this person was destitute, treated like a complete freak, perhaps fairly. And now you're like, oh, she's so great. She's a hero. Where were you then? Where the hell were you then when it actually fucking mattered? So it's it's such a hypocrisy. And, and so people love the outsider in theory. But when push comes to shove, no, 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 no. So Fran Leibowitz, who was a very close friend of, Fran, of, of, of Candy's, worked for Interview Magazine, Andy Warhol's magazine. Martin Scorsese recently did a documentary about her. She just talk, she talked about it. And she goes, look, um, you take these criminals because it was against the law for men to wear women's clothing at the time. You put them in movies and they have this, this idea that they want to be an exact movie star. Candy wants to be exactly Mar Marilyn Monroe. And as Fran says, this was a drag queen fantasy. No one took it seriously at the time except Candy. And Andy goes to her and says, uh, you're not a star like Marilyn Monroe. You're a superstar. He makes it up. It's a joke. Let me assure you this was a joke. So Andy Warhol, who is... Love all your camp references. Thank you so much. I'm getting this all from Camille Paglia. Thank God I read her at a young age because she's the one who, her, her college thesis, which became the basis of her first book, Sexual Persona, was all about uh, constru social construction of gender and androgyny, and it's so interesting. Uh, so it, we can get to that in a second. So what Warhol would do is he would surround himself with people who were fringe, and pariahs, Hollywood Lawn, there were three three queens that Warhol was associated with. Hollywood Lawn was transgender, lived her life as a woman, by which I mean lived her life as a woman. Hollywood Lawn's autobiography was called A Low Life in High Heels. There was no pretense there that these were uh, rich, bougie people. So Warhol puts Candy in one movie, uh, and then the next movie, what does Andy Warhol do? It's the early 70s. Paul Morrissey really made all his movies. Uh, he made a movie about women's, women's liberation, the feminist movement. And as the feminists, he casts three drag queens, Candy, uh, Jackie Curtis, and Hollywood Lawn. And the whole film is about them talking about how much they hate men and how men oppress them. It's very, very funny. So she's hobnobbing. First of all, let's, what else I find inspirational in the sense of thought-provoking is what is this person's life like? You can't walk down the street because it's perfectly okay to yell at you. Uh, you can't get a job. How are you dating? How are you doing anything? It's just, there's no function. It's just fascinating to me. And it's fascinating to me, like, how does she perceive herself and so on and so forth. And in fact, you know, one of her quotes, which I love in a very Randian quote, she says, um, you must always be true to yourself no matter what the price. It's the highest form of morality, which is absolutely something I, I believe. However... She started taking, oh, and it's funny, she had a sense of humor. Warhol asked her, Candy, how often do you get your period? She's like, every day I have, I'm such a woman. Warhol, uh, she started taking illegal hormones. Then she got a mass in her stomach and she told her best friend, Jeremiah, oh, I think I'm, I've got, uh, um, God gave me a baby. It turns out to be cancer. And before the age of 30 in 1974, because of these carcinogenic hormones, she died. Um, her mom destroyed all her stuff, never told her new husband about Candy. Her older brother, older half-brother denied her existence. Her dad wanted nothing to do with her. So she was, com her life was just completely, just literally tossed in the trash, except for a few effects. So there's just so many aspects here of that I find interesting, especially the idea that of the, of, uh, Palia talks a lot about how women know what they are, men have to become something. A man has to fight for his identity, women don't. So the idea that she pulled this off and is like in vogue, she was in vogue, she's hanging out with James Fonda uh, and all this other stuff. It's just the fact that she pulled it off to any extent is absolutely amazing. So here's what I have. I have from her, this is her like a passport photo. Oh, so how I got this journal? 
So I've been looking for an autograph of hers for a very long time. And finally one came up on eBay and I was going to bid on it. Someone paid two grand. And I'm like, listen, you want to pay two grand for this? More power to you. When someone else, when a dealer saw that someone paid two grand, he put up a letter of hers on eBay. I won the letter. I went to his house and he had like her estate that he got from her best friend, Jeremiah. So I got a bunch of stuff for not that much money, but a lot of money, um, which is going to only appreciate in value, but I'd never sell it. So this is her passport photo. I think I'm holding in the right place. And on the back, it has her legal name. She changed it later. I don't think there's any that many signatures of her dead name floating around. And this is her journal. So it's a spiral bound notebook. And I took photos of every page so I'd never have to open it. Um, what she did is, I guess this is what people did at the time. She, yeah, if any guys want to contribute to, towards paying for this, it's, it would be enormously appreciated. So in that journal, she writes letters that she never mailed. There's a borscht recipe. There's little like qu little quips. Um, there's some letters I'm not going to read, which are just really would uh, for whatever reason. Um, Jane Fonda's phone number's in there. So I'm going to read some of the things um, from there. And no one's ever seen these before. So uh, the woman writing her biography is called Cynthia Carr. I think she works for the Times. The book's supposed to come out later this year. Um, so let me read you some of these excerpts. Let me read you this childhood letter from when she was in camp um, to her older half-brother who later went on to deny her. And here's the other thing. This is what I was thinking about also. I said, why is it that if this kid woke up and thought he was Abe Lincoln, which is, you know, the stereotypical crazy person back in the day, Thank you, Cody. Oh, you have to listen to that Tom episode. Why is it that if she woke up and decided to be Abe Lincoln, her family would have... Oh, Ed, thank you so much. Her family would have sympathy and compassion for her. But because she woke up and decided to be Kim Novak, it's someone who is reviled and... Thank you so much, uh, Bradley. She's reviled and treated with contempt. And that it's, it's regarded as acceptable. I, I didn't know how to reconcile that um, uh, completely. And it's something that I've been ruminating out about a lot um okay so let me read you this is from when she's a kid to her older half brother dear uh, this is from mom the mom's the first half dear warren received a telegram from camp that there was no polio uh no polio case so that was good news i just this from 1954 by the way i just got home jimmy wants to write to you so i'll sign off mother and this is in the little kid handwriting you know you guys know what the handwriting looks like it's it's really cute um, dear Warren, today was my first day. At, how are you? The question mark is backwards, by the way. Today was my first day at camp. They have a snack bar, a dressing room, swings, seesaws, and a real slippery slide. It's real high, and when you get off, you run, or else you'll fall. We have a swimming pool, and we have tr uh, tribes. I'm a Blackfoot brave. Oh, it's like Elizabeth Warren. We went on a hike today up to Lookout Mountain. You can make echoes, and when you stand on this stump, it looks like you're on Mount Everest. Daddy's taking me to a carnival. We went to Aunt Edie's for a week. Then I stayed there by myself for a week. Then me, Edie, Billy, K, and B went to our house. Gee, I'm awful lonely here without you. You know, I, it's you know, reading something like this and knowing that you know, 25 years later, this person is going to be dead. And, and that this all this family is going to turn their back on her. It's, 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 I don't know. It's just it's heartbreaking. Um, when you see any kids saying I'm awful lonely, I, I, that gets to me. I don't know, on a fundamental level. Um, I went to aunties with mommy, daddy, and they left me there. And they, they thought that Blackie was going to die for sure. Um, Patches got more kitties. We might get a puppy with Blackie. Wish I was in Florida with you. Love, Jimmy. P.S. I have... Uh, nice, funny, what the fuck does that say? Council? I don't know what that says. All right, then let me read you some of these. Um, the, the other thing that I find so interesting about her is uh, I, I, I'll get into that in a second. Let me read you some more of these pieces. So this is, I mean, this shows this, Dear Kathy, 
I was glad to hear from you. I was in Toronto, Canada on a publicity tour with Andy. It was so exciting. Did you see my picture in photo play? What? You didn't know? Yes, my dear. Your famous cousin has finally made page five of the January issue of our old Bible. Remember how we used to pour over there over them for fan magazines, drooling over Liz and Kim, hating Debbie? I guess that's Debbie Reynolds. Well, now they all drool over me because I'm famous and I'm beautiful in my 82 pounds of makeup. And then... So she's, a lot of times she's writing these little notes, and I can't tell, oh, counselor, that's probably a thank you. I can't tell if this is from, because she, before this it says, imitations of Barbara Streisand living in, oh, here's some other things about her. Gore Vidal, who famously um, feuded with William F. Buckley, there was a documentary made about the two of them, read a book, wrote a book called Myra Breckenridge from the early 70s, and it was a big scandal. And Myra Breckenridge is a book about a guy named Myron who get, goes to Europe, gets a sex change, comes back as Myron, shocks his hometown. Candy fought very hard to get the part. They gave it to Raquel Welch. <laughs> and Candy's point is, I guess Raquel Welch is a better transvestite than me. Okay. So this is kind of a peek into her life. You, but I can't tell if she's writing it as herself or as... Um, like a, um, for somebody else, like in a, in a movie. Do you think I like eating bean soup and peanut butter for strength and protein instead of steak? Well, I don't like it. Do you think I like this mop of goldish red hair instead of the darkest and blonde with pearl streaks? Well, I don't like it. And I don't like wet cakes and day-old bread either. And I'm tired of going to beauty culture school for a permanent. I'm just tired, Frank. So that's kind of hits you in the feels a little bit. Um, and then this one is really, really funny. Uh, this is her having self-awareness. And I'm a good... Um, I took this at face value. My friend had to point out that she's joking. So she trolled me. This is really, really funny. Uh... I know I'm destined for stardom because when I walk along the street, I sometimes see people staring at me and pointing. <laughs> and the other day, I overheard one woman saying to some man, I know where she belongs. Also, while uptown on a bus, I had a tremendous black velvet slouch hat on, a trench coat knotted around the waist, and large dark glasses with Aurora Borealis trim. And when I put the two dimes in the machine, the bus driver called me back and said, It's 30 cents, Greta. Around the village, I'm affectionately known as the actress. Uh, and then there's one last one, which is really kind of poignant. It is now November 24th, around 4 a.m. Today is my birthday. I am happy. Ron Link called me and told me that Jackie did not show up at Ron Del Center's office. I want to do Glamour, Glory, and Gold. That's Jackie's play more than anything. I will have to wait around Max's, Max's Kansas City, some night until Jackie comes in. There's no cell phones there, right? until Jackie comes in and bargain with it. My nails were completely bitten to the quick last night and I've promised myself that I will never pick or bite my nails again and from now on I will apply RRP nail conditioner every night. Tomorrow I will have to wax my arms. Jeremiah is such a dear. He called and wants to have a party for me. I hope we are friends forever. So yeah, it's it's um it's interesting stuff. Uh I don't know, there's just so much to unpack with her um, life. And uh, just, you know, like, I, I just, y you know what it is? Like, Harvey was like this, Harvey Picar. Harvey Picar and, and some other people I know is someone who his flaws really controlled a lot of his life, like the functionality of his life. And I'm fascinated by people whose are trapped by certain aspects of themselves and what that's like and it's scary and it's also fascinating because theoretically these people should be deserving of sympathy and empathy but in real life they are almost never that's never the case so this kind of being trapped within your own self is i don't know man it it, it i don't know why i find that so poignant and interesting um yeah, 
So I'm very much looking forward to the book. Um, there's yeah, there's a few videos of her online. It's just I, I just also it's uh, I also find it interesting how people become canonized. So she's in the process of they're 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 start, you're going to start canonizing her as this kind of trans pioneer. It wasn't that clear cut. Oh, so by the way, I basically found the murder weapon. So at one point, she scribbles down the name of this book and author. And my understanding is, I downloaded a copy of the book, I'm reading it now, called The Transgender Phenomenon. I think that's the book that tells her what hormones to take. And I think that's the book that told, it, that told her to take the hormones that killed her. So there's something kind of creepy reading her writing the title of this book, knowing this is going to be her undoing. It's, ooh, it's really weird. Maybe you feel this way because you relate and are interested in the outcomes of these people. I, I just, I, 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 I can't answer what it's, first of all, I'm a huge admirer of willpower. Huge admirer of willpower. So the fact that she committed and pulled this off to any extent is amazing to me and inspirational to me. That is inspirational in a very real sense, not just thought-provoking, but like admirable. Um, there's also just uh, this idea of, she talks about this elsewhere in the book, where she knows that the people around her are phonies, and they're only interested in having her around for the sake of being able to basically say, look how cool I am, I've got this freak next to me, you know, so she's aware that she's filling that role for some people. We see it nowadays um, where like urban urban whites have to have that one minority friend or you know, um, urban white females have their gay friend as a prop. And it's like they don't see this other person as a human being, but as an accessory. And it's it's uh, it's interesting that she's aware of that and um, um, talks about that. Yeah, so, oof. and it's also interesting to me that um, every, I'm very, 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 very against the idea that the personal is the political, that everything you do has to have a political ramification. So the fact that her life is shortly probably going to be taken exclusively in a political context, I find really unfortunate because I think she's much more interesting as a, a character study and a life story than as a prop for some legislation. Um, so, yeah. And it's, it's I, I mean, that's the thing to be, it, what this is like in 1972, she died in 74 to be walking around Manhattan like this. I mean, there's a lot of photos where you look, she's totally passing. You know, she she's not, she's very, very feminine. But there's a couple where the five o'clock shadow is sticking out. And it, looking at that, it's very jarring. It's very, very jarring. Um, so I guess that's my two cents on candy. Um, and I think this is also the Thaddeus Russell thing. Thaddeus Russell is a book I recommend constantly, Renegade History of the United States. His point being it's the people who are the pariahs, the, the renegades, you know, the degenerates, who are the ones who are pushing culture. And let me give you another example. Um, Comic-Con. Comic-Con has become totally mainstream. 15 years ago, maybe not 15, maybe longer. If you were an adult guy dressing up for Comic-Con, then it was exactly right now like being a furry. Total freak and loser. And now... Once the weird girls started doing it, and then the regular guys and the regular girls started doing it, now it's like totally acceptable and normal. But it had to be those people at the beginning who had to be on the train dressed as Fat Batman to make that happen for everybody else. And Fat Batman will never get the cred he deserves. Or he'll be, you know, 40 years later, people will be like, oh, I've always been for Fat Batman. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's great. And oh, you even see it right now. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, there was a period, remember, there was got to stop bullying, got to stop bullying. Bullying's bad, bullying's bad. As soon as all those gamers and nerds came out against PC culture, they're white supremacists and the devil. So as long as they serve a purpose and they're obedient, 
oh yeah, I love them. And as soon as they have their own minds and their own identity, into the trash. Um, I talk about this very heavily in the book, and it's, it's something very important to think about, in my view, where culture comes from and how it develops. And there's this mythos uh, on the right, which is exactly like the feminist mythos. There's a feminist mythos that back in the day, the entire world was a matriarchy, and we know this because of goddess worship and all these statues. You know, in the same way, somehow worshiping a goddess means matriarchy is as if somehow when the Egyptians worshipped the scarab, the scarabs were running Egypt. This makes no sense. And then the patriarchy came and kind of took over and corrupted this lovely matriarchy. And the right has the same idea, which is completely ahistorical, just like the feminists, that culture used to be right wing and good American values. And then somehow the left came and took it over and corrupted it. And this is completely ahistorical. Uh, American culture has been always regarded as degenerate. Vaudeville, burlesque, uh, you know, this is very low class stuff. Um, rock and roll, you know, the, the, and, and then it becomes championed. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're always for this. No, 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 you are not. You're for it now that it's safe. So, um, yeah, okay. Whew. Uh, I guess that's all I had to say on the subject, but I thought I was going to go longer um, about this issue. But this is something I cherish it, um, having. Absolutely. And I also like the idea. This is kind of, there's something, something kind of ironic. Of two, I'm of two minds. So I put up a photo of her journal on my Instagram, and it gets like 40 likes. And then I put up a photo of like, you know, some tweet, and it gets like 500. And I'm like, folks, this is a little part of American history that I'm unveiling. And it's like, on the, on the one hand, I love liking music and books and figures that are obscure because then it's just for me and like everyone else's grubby hands aren't all over it. On the other hand, it's like, hey, how come no one else likes this? You know, it's, it's I'm a complete hypocrite. So I don't know. Oh, yeah, by the way, she, the the Smiths have her photo as an album cover. Um, the, the Velvet Underground wrote a song about her and Lou Reed's Take a Walk in the Wild Side has a lyric about her. It's about the three queens. It's Candy, Jackie, and Holly are the lyrics from Take a Walk in the Wild Side. Um, so yeah, that is where we are now. Um, good times. Oh, I left a lot behind. What did I leave behind? I, I mean, there was so much there. I figure having, I got the key thing, the journal and, oh, you know what he had? He had a lock of her hair and I'm like, this is creepy as hell. So that was, that was uh, disturbing there. Um, and there was also a candle named uh, um, Candy, Candy Darling um, by Brido or Birdo, I forget how, B Y R E D O, I think it's called. Um, yeah. I don't know, there's a lot I'm thinking about. I, I'm just thinking about these little subcultures these little pockets like the Harlem Renaissance I'm reading a lot about right now, the Warhol scene, the punk scene, these little bubbles that punch very much above their weight. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm glad you enjoy. Um, and I'm also wondering how if leftism is inherently at its uh, about uh, valorizing the outsider, is there any work around people on the right or are they automatically going to have first row seats for the people who are uh, breaking barriers. So, yeah. Um, what else can we talk about? Bef I don't know if any of you asked. I've been looking at the chat. I don't have any news about Gavin and Compound. Not, I have no information. I did get back the second round of copy edits for the book. Uh, so it's still coming out May 14th. And yes, a lot of this stuff is in there. Thoughts on the punk band Crass? I don't like them. I, I mean, I don't like punk after like 78. I'm sorry. It's very upsetting that conservatives still think trans people aren't worthy of ba basic respect unless they're conservative. Yeah, he, here's the thing. I, 
uh, Chelsea Manning had some tweet about let's abolish the presidency and I retweeted and someone uh, replied goes he makes a good point listen you think I get it I, I totally get why people are like I don't want to shove down my throat blah 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 stop making me I get that I get it it's clearly an agenda and a political thing I get that on one hand on the other hand if you think using the wrong pronoun makes you it, and I get how in your head maybe you think it's a little bit of rebellion but you're not persuading anyone, and it's 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 lazy. It's it's not clever. If you didn't, I, I don't. It's in the same way that like I just tweeted out something about. Um, uh, I, I tweeted out if Elizabeth Warren were a man, she'd be more unlikable. And someone goes, if you were a man, you'd be more unlikable. You'd be more likable. Uh, okay, is calling me a woman an insult? Is calling a woman a man an insult? I mean, what does that even mean? doesn't make sense so it's stupid uh and i i i think it's 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 it's, yeah whatever um yeah so that that's the thing and i it doesn't i even ben shapiro i think has come around on this issue a little bit um and you don't have to like it i i mean there's i i think yeah anyway um Yeah, I get the pushback, and I think the pushback is fair, if, as, if it's pushback. But there, that's the whole thing, is that people like this get championed and used as wedge issues. And then it's, I, I, I think, do you keep journals? I don't keep journals, no, I don't. I, I think that it is, I don't want to say unjust, because I don't really believe in justice as an effective concept. I think it is unfortunate that someone who has such so much to offer and who's interesting is so destitute i i just i i think candy darling is a lot better person than peter keating and even if you're going to take the total right-wing perspective that she's a complete lunatic okay oh that's the other thing that drives me crazy this is the one um this is the one is when people are like um Oh, you think crazy people are interesting? Palia talks about this a lot. Her quote that she's very proud of is that the reason, in her, these are her words, the reason that there's no female Mozart is because there's no female Jack the Ripper and that artistry is created by mania and there's a psychopathy almost to it. And uh, off the top of my head, a great example is Van Gogh. Um, I'm, and you could hear these Peter Keating say very easily, yeah, some guy who cuts off his ear, I really don't need to see what his canvases look like. And you can hear them. This is their thought process. And it's so... Again, there's no self there. They're not a person. So it's, it's a, um, that mentality. Is, it's like, oh, so some dude thought he was a chick and you think that's interesting? Inherently, no. That's not interesting. This life, the fact that he became a movie star, that is interesting. And the fact that he's in a movie star, kinda, and and is destitute, yeah. What do you think is the cause of the conflicting definition of what true freedom means? Anytime someone puts the word true in quotes, and I'm not attacking you, I'm just saying it's used all the time, they're trying to get over. Even the gay, I've pointed this out many times, everyone is for freedom. Literally, even the gates of Auschwitz, even the gates of Auschwitz spoke of freedom. The gateway to hell talks about freedom. Arbach mach frei, work makes you free. Everyone's for freedom. Because they're trying to beg the question, begging the question, meaning assuming that which you're trying to prove. So true, in, when people use it like that, means that variant of which I am like, I like and I'm going to define now. So, yeah. That is that. And that's the other thing I also want to point out. Thank you, um, Jordan. There's this movement on the right. So much of right-wingism is a reaction to the left instead of being its own thing, which is not a power position to be in, and it's not creative or interesting or original. Um, if you just thought Candy is just 
crazy, a little empathy, a little sympathy would go a long way. But they don't treat these people with sympathy. It's very often contempt. So if someone, so if someone is messed up, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you have had to deal with people who, oh, here's another thing. Uh, oh, let's talk about this. Craziness. Crazy. The word crazy covers, and mental illness, cover a lot of range. And to use that as a term of dismissiveness is insane. Because it could mean someone who deals with chronic depression. Or it could mean someone who thinks he's Lincoln. And anywhere in between. These are not all identical phenomena. They're not going to be equally functional. They're not going to be equally dangerous. And again, if this is not a person's fault that they have this mental illness, the idea that they should be pariahs at the just out of principle maybe they have to be pariahs because they're dangerous and you can't do anything with them i can get my head around that but the idea of like oh you're disgusting get away from me it's it's sad and a little you know that's all i'm saying um yeah so that is what i think about that it's just funny reading like her borscht recipes and, uh, you know, just, I don't know, a lot to think about. A lot to think about with her. And so there's a doc, is it, it is hard for the right to create culture because so much of that size of religious doesn't want to change. I think it's hard for the right to create cu culture because there is on the, there is an aversion to creativity. I'm, I'm, let me finish my thought because I'm already hearing the responses. Aversion to creativity in the sense of the novel and the new. And those two things psychologically go hand in hand with being right wing. And this is not a criticism of being right wing. Because a lot of you need people who are suspicious and who want things to maintain. If we had a society completely change every 20 years, this would be hell on earth. So there is absolutely a role for right-wing thought. And there's also a role of, you know what? I know what foods I like. I don't need to try new foods. Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm going to have to talk to that about this, I think, at length. I, again, I get into this heavily in my book, in my chapter with Jared Taylor, um, about low culture and things like that. Uh Whew. Man. It's also interesting how the hypocrisy... Um, no, never mind. If you're interested in the Harlem Renaissance, you check out Carl Van Vechten's old photographs already. Way ahead of you. I'm reading biography of Alan Locke right now. Carl Van Vechten is also good friends with Gertrude Stein and um, Alice B. Toklas. I read a biography of him too. He's really the ultimate poser. Complete ultimate poser. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be going to... I'm going to get a, a gimbal very shortly so I can walk around um, New York and do my little live streams on the street. That's going to be... But do you think there's an objective notion of freedom... Am I wrong in assuming you have true freedom? I think there's different definitions of freedom. Politically, anarchism is, is, would be correct freedom. Um, freedom can also mean you know what I feel free to do in a relationship, right? I'm not free to whatever, fart in front of whatever. So uh, it has different contextual definitions. Um, I, I guess this is is my answer to that. It's oh, here's something else. I can't wait to go to CPAC because last year um, there were three <laughs> oh never mind. I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it cuz I'm going this year to I'm going to crowdsource my train ticket and I'm going to have my camera and I'm going to have so much fun with those people. It's going to be really fun. It's gonna be really fun. I pro that's gonna be amazing. Yeah. 
I hope you walk around New York with a camera and a big hat, like Homer Simpson with one of those cowboy hats where it hurts my neck. Um, no, I'm gonna. I think it's even more obnoxious to have that camera on a stick thing, which is what the gimbal, which is what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be a modern day Tim Pool. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Oh yeah. You follow my favorite girls on Twitter. I don't know who you are. Good times, Roth. I'll follow you. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, the whole thing with... What do you think of Varj Rick I have no idea who that is. Never heard of him. Uh, the whole thing with the... The whole thing with the pronouns thing, you you have no pro you could be autistic you could be totally autistic and be like you're not you're not really a man you have no shit. Do you make that point when someone has like adopted kids? You're like that's not your kid. You're not really their mother. It's fine. And do you have an issue? And here's the other thing. Caitlyn Jenner is a good example. Well, that's not really a woman. I'm not gonna call him Caitlyn. I'm gonna call him Bruce. Do you have any problems calling Alice Cooper Alice? So, pretend it's a dude with a woman's name. Call him Caitlin. It's not hard. Did I miss the... I don't know who... Should I look this person up? You see how something... I've got a feeling he doesn't have a lot to do with Candy Darling. Oh, I've heard of this guy. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. Oh, yeah, I didn't know his... I didn't recognize his name, though. Yeah, he, yeah, a lot of cool stuff overseas. Um, what I want to know, actually, is <laughs> at the same time, you don't have to think that Caitlyn Jenner is beautiful. What about the Patreon Act? I don't know. What you, I'm moving. I'm moving to Dave Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson's thing from Patreon as soon as that moves. So I'm jumping ship the first second I can. Um, I want to know from you guys, whoever watched the episode with Tom Woods, if you thought it was thought provoking, and if so, what thoughts you got provoked? Yeah, the Bowie thing shocked me. Oh god, you're going to okay guys, it's a lot of here to unpack, hold on. Tom wasn't dodging the question, he just hadn't thought about it before, so he wanted to give a good answer. I don't know if that Tom and I really disagree that much. I wouldn't use that, that, that word. <sighs> That's not true. I've been to Cleveland, yeah, that's where Harvey Picard's from, come on. It, Brian, it was fun poking, but I don't think I was poking him in a, a I mean, I was poking myself because I was, I didn't know um, if I had the right answer. I didn't know which one of us was right or wrong.
I don't find Jefferson inspirational at all. Love the episode. Nice to learn about Tom outside of his show. Did you ever discuss your post in the Facebook group? I did not. Oh, that's really cool, T T Tennessee Gunner. Yeah, I mailed that out. So when do you get those? Where do you get those thumbnails of Tom dozing off and looking furious? I'm Michael Malice. I know what I'm doing. I don't have a. I don't have a folder. No, I don't. That was a meme of his. Tom making that face. So if you Google Tom Woods meme, it'll come up. Do you think he will write an ebook about his experience? Yeah, I think he's, he's ANCAP versus anarchist. Why the downplay of CAP? Because I said on the show I uh, am more comfortable defending anarchism than I am defending capitalism. I don't know. Is that really Tom? Let me see if that's really him. Yeah, I don't know that that's Tom. Tom Tom would have a wrench. Go to channel. Yeah, that's not Tom. I unmodded him. I unmodded him. Imagine being this person. Tom was Luigi in the mirror, but I don't know what that means. That's pretty funny, though. Um, what? A dope. It might still be him. Who knows? It does sound like what he would say. Yeah, Tom. It's not Tom Woods TV. It just says Tom Woods, if that's you. I am not answering a question that you can Google for yourself. I'm going to text him right now, if that's really him. You know what he won't find? Is that you on the stream? I'm not going to ask him to call me. Oh, it's actually Bob Murphy. Yes, okay, it's him. All right. It seems you and Tom passed over the idea of what you were getting at being universal. Can you essentialize what the disagreement was? Um, because the idea that the it's the it's the um, low lives who make culture. I don't know if that's true in Europe or two hundred years ago. I'm talking specifically of low culture, which is a recent Tom and Al, uh, a recent phenomenon historically. Television is obviously historically very new uh, internet's very new um music in the sense that we consume it is recent so that's why i don't know that this would apply to and i think the models are different you'd have a patron um but here's actually a good counter example wait the tom and alan interviews seem to be full of more but good tension pushing the issue yeah thanks brian i did it's fun when you're talking to people who you're, you're good friends with so you can kind of be more uh, aggressive a little bit with the questioning um I was trying to think of counterexamples to the theory, and I thought of Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind. Like, that is, okay, someone who clearly moved American pop culture. She's not really marginalized just because she's a woman. That doesn't count. I looked it up. 
total porn freak. I'm not joking. Look it up. It's on her Wikipedia. She had a huge erotica collection, and this is back then. So she was a freak. I'll give Tama, um, whatchamacallit. I'll give Tama, uh, uh, moderator. Okay, he's got the wrench now. I guess we're all doubting Thomas. <laughs> that was pretty good. Margaret Mitchell, author of Gone with the Wind. Yeah. There he is. There he is. Authoress. Ooh, should I read something from the book? Nah. I uh, it, it was funny. I I I emailed um someone for a blurb for the book who I thought we were close enough, and he's like, I don't know if I can. Let me read it first. And I'm like, mm, no. You should want to endorse it without having read it. So, yeah. And they're, they're in the book pretty heavily. Um, the guest this week is Nomiki Konst. It's going to be really fun. Then we have the Jin episode, which I am looking forward to. Huh. All right. Um, oh, it's been an hour. Jeez. What I think I'm going to do is maybe for people who pre-order, who super chat, did you enjoy the comedy of Emo Phillips? I'm not that familiar with it. Any comment on the death of Tim May and the future of crypto anarchism? I am all in the crypto anarchist camp. Um, I don't know what you mean by killer app, though. I'm not informed on this subject as much as I should be, although I'm like one degree of separation from everyone in that school. Um, uh, yeah. Hmm. God, CPAC, man. That's going to be fun. That's going to be a lot of fun. Let me see if that book is is on Amazon, the book about candy. Her her journal, there's like like a book of her diaries. It's a hundred dollars. Holy shit! For so in 1997, Jeremiah published excerpts from her other journals, um, as a pink diary with a lock, and it's a hundred dollars now. Good lord, that's crazy. No, it's not available on Amazon yet. All right. All right. If we super chat, you'll do a private stream with preview stuff? No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. Here's what I'm thinking. I have the printout of the book, and I had to hand make the edits. So I'm thinking, like, if people super chat, I'll give them a page of the actual first print, you know, the, the, the mock-up. Um... I am following Brazil, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I would love to be on Jimmy's show. He's great. I would love to be on, his, on Jimmy's show. Let me see what else is in this journal that might be of interest that I could feel comfortable sharing. Um, I, you know, The other thing that's interesting about her is when someone dies at age 30, it's, it's kind of like there's such a you know, poignancy to it too. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I took photos of the whole collection. The other thing is, this is really, really weird. The handwriting kept changing in the journals. And part of it, I'm sure, is when she's on speed, because they did a lot of speed back then. Just that changes. But other times, it's not speed. Like from, It's just very weird. And I have no theories as to why. Hmm. 
There's an escargot recipe. Oh, here's one. There's, I, I think I did. I beat the thing with Marilyn Monroe. There was one quote she had, which was really kind of out of nowhere. It was just just the quote, and she goes, um, "Marilyn Monroe, towards the end of her career, showed the world how beautiful and desirable she was. At the same time, how unhappy and lonely she was." So, mm, it's a. Uh, how do you know when it's time to quit your day job to pursue a more meaningful career? I only did it once I was able to pay my rent. So I think that's the issue. Or you know what else I did? I put in those 14 hour days basically working in my career and having the day job. And I don't regret any minute of it. Was she testing out more feminine handwriting? No. It's not. It just changes from... It's just different kinds of handwriting. I have no clue. There's a lot of pages, by the way, when I think about how much money I paid for this thing, where she's just signing her name over and over, Candy Darling, Candy Darling, Candy Darling. I'm like, you know what? I can sell each of those autographs for a pretty penny, so the book will pay for itself if I ever wanted to separate it out. Um, see, this this is so stupid to me. She sounds mental like that dude, Caitlin. Okay, just because someone's mental, if even that's true, does not make them interesting. Uh, schizophrenia handwriting, yeah. Let me look that up. That might be it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't have any theories. It would. It's. It's. Very extreme. Very extreme. If you and Tom think differently on a fundamental level, how many types of thought are there? Oh, I think there's several different axes. Uh, very many different axes. Um, and some were identical and some were antipodes. So, yeah. How many months of rent do you need? I, I mean... If your side gig, side hustle, is looks like it's going to be a steady... Tom, what's your answer? Uh, like Enough to pay your rent? It's not that you need it in savings. It's that I'm making enough as a side hustle that I can pay my rent. Yeah, Warhol would ask her how often she had her period. She said, every day, I'm such a woman. And if you're thinking about quitting your day job, also maybe start by building your emergency fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with Tom. Also, if you have a job that you can quit and try something else on the side, you might be able to get another job if you need to. So if you have like a good resume, you know what I mean? I, honestly, it's better to be hungry and have no regrets than to be fed and when you're 40, be like, ugh, why did I stay with that day job? Here's the thing that drives me crazy with the Peter Keating mentality. Faust, the story of the guy who sold his soul to the devil, I think he became the world's greatest violinist. If you're going to sell your soul, do it for more than a $40,000 a year corporate gig. I mean, this is what people are doing. They're like, I'm going to give up all my hopes and dreams for security. And like, this is your hopes and this is your security? This is what you're doing? If you're going to make a deal with the devil, you know, get a model wife or a mansion. My apartment is um, at ground zero, so that's why you hear all the fire trucks. Those are ghosts. I don't know who Dave Ramsey is. I don't know yeah, who that is. All right, this is kicked. Hmm. Um, by the way, oh my God, this is something else that's exciting. I only drink Monster. 
Monday, I got a package of stuff coming from a fan went to Japan. And I'm getting all sorts of things, including this bottle of really rare liquor that I've been looking for for a long time that you've probably never heard of. So I can't wait to unpack this on Monday on Nightshade. It's going to be really, really fun. It's going to be really, really fun. Um, okay. I, if anyone else has, I, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, I was going to bounce in a minute and do my more reading about Alan Locke. All right, people. The print. Co I don't know. Send me that nightshade clip. Which one, Tom? I, I'm not joking. Text me. Any updates on Sam Hyde? I haven't asked him. Um, Roger. Um, what nightshade clip, Tom? I'm blanking. Oh, okay. Let me do that right now. Can you pull the episode of Night Shade with Tom Woods, please? Doesn't Okay, sent. All right. Good night, Daddy. <laughs> I trolled you? Yeah, 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 okay. Um uh, Andrew, that's nice to hear. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. No, my Ed McMahon should be Simon, but he's not having it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this little history lesson, and I'm expecting... I'm going to leave this up. I'm sure I'm going to get lots of shitty comments from candy fans. Um, but... Can't be helped. This is just my view on, on who she is and what she represents. So uh, that's where we uh, stand. Okay. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.